Welcome back to building a web server. In this video, we're going to be talking about multi-processing. So recall that previously we talked about the steps of accepting a TCP IP network connection. We did socket, bind, listen, accept. And eventually when someone decided to connect to us, we accepted their connection and were able to read and write to that connection uh, abstract file socket concept. Okay, so what happens though if we have lots of HTTP requests? Let's say we have a very popular web server. We've got this popular website we're running and we're getting hundreds of requests a second. We've got thousands of requests a second. Um, lots of people are hitting our program. Well, there's an issue. And the issue is that if we want to talk to the environment, as we've previously said, we perform a system call. And the accept system call is how we accept one of those connections. Well, what happens when we're doing computation and interacting with our environment further to facilitate that singular connection, that singular HTTP request? What happens to all these other connections that are trying to come through? Well, the kernel is smart enough to queue them up, but let's say that after we accept the connection and we need to continue on, that maybe our, our hard drive is, is extremely slow. Maybe accessing that flag file is, is you know, it's going to take five minutes for it to pull from the hard drive uh, the contents of that flag. It's extremely slow. Or more realistically, let's pretend, you know, we have a, a real web server that's doing something a little more interesting, performing all types of complex, um, all types of complex computation let's say, on data, you know, facilitating some sort of dynamic response. And uh, even if it's only going to take one second to do all of that computation, if we're getting hundreds of requests a second, we can't just be going one at a time, right, going through them, because this backlog is going to grow really fast. We want to be handling all of them concurrently, ideally. So how do we do that? Well, there's another system call, as you might imagine, because system calls are really kind of how we interact with our environment. And our process is this concept within the kernel that manages a bunch of stateful data related to our user space program. Um, if we want to create a new process, which if we create a new process, you know, maybe we can start doing things in parallel or, you know, letting the, the kernel schedule our processes and interleave them and do cool things for us. But let's just imagine, you know, we have this multi-core machine and we can just run lots of code uh, concurrently. We want to create one of those new processes. The way that we're going to do that is using the fork system call. What fork does is it creates a new process by duplicating the calling process. So the new process is referred to as the child process and the calling process is referred to as the parent process. So if we go through and we perform this fork system call, uh, what happens? Like, what, what does this mean? Because in some sense, if we're saying we're kind of forking, we're creating two processes, how does that work in terms of, well, now we just had a bunch of code that's going to execute on the CPU. Something's going to execute after this fork instruction. And now it's going to like execute twice. And like, how do we manage the fact that like we've just split into two? Well, what happens, and the first thing to note is that when we do that, is that on success, the PID of the child process is returned to the parent and zero is returned to the child. So in some sense, when we go through and we perform this fork system call, the way that we can tell whether we're the parent or the child is the result of that fork system call. The result is going to tell us, hey, are we the parent? Or are we the child? And now we can do conditional logic, right? We can just do computation to compare that value uh, against zero to know if we're the child or not. And we can do different bits of logic in the parent and different bits of logic in the child. And now we've kind of forked off, have two processes, and these two processes don't have to just be executing the same code. They can compare off of that value and do different things because it has a value to compare against. Another thing to note is that we've said that a process is managed in the kernel as kind of this just blob of data that's maintaining all of the important stateful information about the process. That blob of data just effectively gets duplicated. We have a second copy of it. Some fields get updated. A lot of fields get updated. Um, but at its core, a lot of it is just duplicated. A lot of things are ready so that if something gets changed, you know, we don't have updates in the parent. If the child makes an update, some things do actually update and like We'll see, for example, with file descriptors, um, we can see that, for example, we have this file descriptor three and file descriptor four. Um, both this parent and this child right now could be talking over the internet 
over the same socket that just got duplicated. Both could be talking um, and communicating with the internet kind of simultaneously. It would get a little confusing, but they could be. Um, on the other hand, though, we have all of these memory mappings that they're being maintained. Um, and if the child decided that it wants to write something into memory, we don't want that somehow messing up the parent. There is a concept of shared memory, but by default, Fork assumes that we kind of don't want shared memory. And instead, what's going to happen is that as soon as someone updates a page of memory, that page of memory will kind of just become its own for the child, and the memory modifications won't be shared across. Okay. So let's, for example, now say that the parent goes on to call close. So it decides to close file descriptor number four. What does this mean? Well, what this means is looking back at the parent process and the child process, this parent is its own process. So it closes file descriptor four. Well, guess what? File descriptor four is now closed on the parent. But the child, which after previously forking, after getting this file descriptor already inherited, kind of it's being inherited from the parent, the parent closes it, that doesn't mean the child just automatically closes it, the child still has access to it. If the child wants that closed, it's going to have to close it itself. Okay, so now let's say instead, though, maybe the child wants to close file descriptor 3. So the parent closed file descriptor 4, the child closes file descriptor 3. Again, similarly, the child is about to lose access to file descriptor 3. Uh, the parent still has access to file descriptor 3. So this is in some sense what we've just done by closing uh, 4 on the parent and 3 on the child is that we've made it so that the parent is still able to accept another connection because file descriptor 3 was that socket that we accept connections on, um, but the parent is not allowed to talk to that specific connection request, um, whereas the child can no longer accept uh, new incoming connections on file descriptor 3 because it's closed it, but it is able to talk across file descriptor number 4 and start talking to that specific connection. Hopefully you see where this is going. The parent now can call accept again. It can just leave the child off to do whatever it wants to do with that specific individual connection, and it can instead just accept. So we can have this loop within the parent of accepting a connection, forking, closing the specific connection, because we're not interested in it, the child's going to take care of that, and then going back to accepting. So in this way, we have this loop of a parent accepting all of these connections, and then the child facilitating the response to those connections. There's lots of ways to multiprocess a web server, but this is one example of how we can accomplish that within the Linux kernel. So again, we saw that we were getting ready to uh, accept on file descriptor 3 because that's our bound uh, socket for accepting connections. We accept, we get another file descriptor 4, and from there you can imagine now forking again and having a third process, kind of this parent process that's in this loop, and these two child processes kind of concurrently handling the response at the same time. So now each of these child processes could be parsing, they could be reading the, the result of that connection, seeing what kind of HTTP request is being made, parsing it, performing its own computation, performing its own thing. All of this, if we have you know lots of cores on our computer, could be all happening concurrently. We don't have lots of cores. The kernel, as it turns out, also has another feature, which is it'll do scheduling for us, and it'll just kind of keep rotating all of these processes, who gets to execute at once. Um, but in this way, we don't have this problem where if we're getting hundreds of connections at once and facilitating each one takes a second, that we have this indefinite backlog. Instead, we can have a scheduling system and we can be doing things concurrently and uh, we can have a real web server responding to lots of people at once.